Mechanical design. When switching lenses in a microscope, click, click. How does the passive lock work? Because we know in order for us to see what's under the microscope, the light has to be able to travel through the trajectory. And even if there's a slight misalignment, after it clicks into place, we won't be able to see what's under the microscope. So how exactly does this high precision passive lock work? In this video, if you watch closely, you're gonna learn a lot about SOLIDWORKS. So we have passive locks and active locks. I'm gonna contrast both. Passive locks, which is what I was just showing before, is the revolving nose piece of the microscope. And the way I remember it is a passive lock, you're not participating in making the lock happen. Now an active lock is this thumb screw right here. You unscrew it and it removes the head. It was coming in contact here. It removes the head of the microscope. So the active lock is always active until you disengage it. As you may have guessed, this is a detent mechanism. Now let's take a look at the big picture. If you don't understand the mechanism while I explain it with the parts now, don't worry, I will go over it again on CAD. So big picture is we have this inner disc, which I'm gonna highlight here if you follow along the tip of my screwdriver. This is the inner disc. And then we have this outer part and the inner disc moves independently from the outer part. We have this bikini shaped metal part in which at the end we have the ball shaped plunger right there this ball shaped plunger going into the groove they see there in v and the groove is right in the top of this ramp now if we take a uh, top view this ball shaped plunger will go in in this path until it lands on the next groove and the reason why we have these ramps so not all uh, detent mechanism have ramps. The reason why we have them is to really lock it in place and give it more precision when it the, the precision is the key thing of this mechanism and you have to put additional force in order for the ball plunge the ball shaped plunger to overcome the ramp and allow you to move on to the next. So that's why that's why it feels like it's locked in place when we have a lens it's locked in place because we have to overcome this ramp. And also the precision comes from the two screws here and the bikini part being very precisely put in the middle there. So there you have it. That's the mechanism. So here we have the microscope that I reverse engineer for educational purposes. And this is the, the assembly file. As you can see, the spinning nose piece, the revolving nose piece. And I'm gonna show you that inside it has the center part, which I'm going to isolate to show you. We have the parts that I had in my hands. So now you see where they fit with the rest of the assembly. We've got the little ramps that I was showing you before. The detent mechanism. So this from the top view. This is going to move. The, the green disc moves independently from the rest. We have the underwear piece, which goes along this trajectory, and it's going to encounter the ramp. That's where you feel the resistance when you're spinning the nose piece. I was showing you in the video when the video started, and you encounter this resistance, you go over the ramp, go over, go over, and it clicks into place once you enter the groove. And now to get out of the groove, you're gonna feel that resistance again when you try to spin the revolving nose piece. That's the essence of the mechanism. Now I want to show you how did we get here? How did I model all this? Because a lot of classes that you find online for SOLIDWORKS, they don't teach you how to model. They just teach you tips and tricks. So that's our next step here. So this started like all of my other reverse engineering videos, basically gathering orthogonal pictures and importing them to CAD, getting some rough estimations there in sketching and beginning my extrusions and building the solid bodies. Now, I had a vision when I was building this. And whenever one, one designs something, you need to have a vision as to where you're going and which methods you're gonna use. So right now, this is called master modeling, in which you create all your, your bodies, your solid bodies, in one master file. But I knew that it didn't matter how, the, if the tolerances were very tight on the body of the microscope. 
because it just needed to look like a microscope, but where the tolerances did matter, where the precision did matter, is the actual mechanism that we were studying. So my process, my logic was, okay, let me make a microscope, something that's visually appealing for the thumbnail and for everyone watching, but really I'm gonna focus on this nose piece, and that's why I decided to create a separate master model for the nose piece. And then I will import them both, this master model, which is basically the body of the microscope, and the master model of the nose piece into an assembly file, which I will then have movement because it's an assembly and I could do mates and show the dynamics of how it all works together. Now this is the second master model, which is a part file containing various part files that I'm modeling and all the design intent, as you can see. Now this took me longer than the first part because it's a lot more precise. Precision takes time and attention to detail. And now once I finished this part, I imported them both into what we call the top level assembly. Now I'm gonna show you a pro tip for mating sub-assemblies that I learned from a senior engineer named Jason Ferris, who also works with me at teampipeline.us. So here, uh, I just, I created a, a top level assembly, an actual assembly file, which is gonna provide us with motion and mates, which is something that we didn't have before in the master model, so was, that's one of the differences between master models and assembly files. We've only imported, so we've, I've hidden a lot of stuff. Up to this point, I've only imported one master model, which is the big microscope. And this is the hack that I wanna show you that Jason, my colleague, taught me. So when I made this master model, I had this little part that I added, which is uh, like a placeholder, if you will. As you can see, I didn't finish modeling the nose piece because the master model is just for the big microscope. But I did that on purpose because once you have this little dome, let me hide the sketches so you can see. Once you have this dome, I'm going to use the surfaces and the geometries to make a concentric mate once I have my other master model for the nose piece. So let me show you in real time how that works. I always wondered if people could just show me in real time how they do it because it's not the same if I suppress and then I, I, um, I bring the parts back. I wanna show you in real time how this is done because this is what I wish somebody would have shown me um, with YouTube. So you go to insert components. I actually divided the master model into two parts so I could have easier motion between the green disc and the remaining and the other part. Okay, so now we have the green disc over here, which is that's called the center. And let's import the other part, just noses. Yes, there it is. Now what you wanna do is you wanna make them float because right now they're constrained, you can't even move them. You right click, float. Now you can drag them around. So this is where the little hack comes in play. You're gonna go here and you wanna show, yes, show the axes. And I want to have this made it to this axis that thankfully it's here because of the dome that, I'm, dome that I made before. We're also gonna do that with the nose piece. Now we're going to simply hide the dome. Goodbye. Although the dome is hidden, the mates remain. That's the, the cool part, the hack, if you will. Now, I can peacefully mate, and I know that this is going to be in place because of where the dome was. If I didn't have that dome, I would really struggle trying to put this nose piece into the correct position. Now I bring this over here, made it to the same face. Now I want to simply isolate the two new parts that I imported. So the center and the just the noses, that's what I called it. Once I isolate them, you can see inside, yep, and it works. So if you enjoyed this video, if you learned something new, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, I read all the comments, or shoot me a message on LinkedIn. This video belongs to a playlist called the Mental Mechanism Library, in which we're going to study products all around us figure out how they work internally, and save their mechanisms in our mental mechanism library. This is going to make you a better mechanical design engineer.